Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you all. This is the first time that we have um, ever brought together all three of our clergy in certainly in a sofa and armchair setting to talk about such things as theology and, uh, and, 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 and stuff like that. I know that's one of Sandy's favorite words. Um, but tonight we're talking about the Sabbath, which has been the focus of our formation this past semester and the focus of our, our small book groups. And um, quite a few of you are, have been reading one of three volumes this past semester. So we want to make this a conversation among our clergy, but also among you all as well. And so um, you're encouraged to jump in with any questions. We'd like to bring a microphone to you so we can record your questions. So if you are asking a question or making a comment at some point, be sure to say your name and, uh, and, then, and, and then follow with that. Um, but I thought I'd start by just giving a quick overview of of the books and the authors, um, you know, Sabbath appears pretty early in the Old Testament, um, right in the in Genesis, and certainly in the Ten Commandments. Um, one of our authors, Heschel, points out that one would think, after creating the entire world, that God would have perhaps consecrated or made holy a mountain or a spring or some other place, and instead he chooses to make holy a space of time instead of a space of place. And, and that's a really important idea in his book. We're looking tonight at three books, but the ideas that stem from those. So if you haven't read them, it's absolutely fine. Um, Walter Brueggemann, who will be here next March 3rd, we, are, we read his Sabbath as Resistance. He is an Old Testament scholar, a professor at Eden and Columbia Theological Seminaries in his past, the son of a German evangelical pastor and author of more than 100 books. So Sabbath as Resistance. Sabbath in the Suburbs, One Family's Experiment with Holy Time is a book by Mary Ann McKibben Dana. She is a Presbyterian pastor who calls herself secretly Quaker, uh, a mother of three, a marathon runner uh, who lives just outside Washington, D.C., and she and her family took um, a year as an experiment to dedicate a week, a, a day of every week to the Sabbath. And so the book is about that experiment. And then finally, The Sabbath by Abraham Joshua Heschel, who is a Jewish rabbi, or who was, he died in 1972, was a Jewish rabbi, scholar, philosopher. In World War II, he was deported by the Nazis into Poland, where he taught for eight months and then later left for England. So he did survive the Jewish Holocaust. He was very active in the civil rights movement and um, was a protester in the Civil War, as well, uh, not the Civil War, the Viet uh, Vietnam War. So three really interesting perspectives, um, a lot of overlap and a lot of distinctive ideas as well. So we thought we'd start by having each of our um, priests on the sofa and armchair talk a little bit about the book that they focused on, and in particular, um, what their author's definition of Sabbath perhaps is, and also any revelation that, so to speak, that occurred to you in the reading of your book. Um, Hester, would you begin? Okay, so Kara is asking me to begin because I got really into these books. I um, am not an avid reader. I'm not a fast reader, so when a book captures my attention, it's a big deal. Um, you'll see my phone is on top of my stack because most of my books are on Audible. I listen to most of them. I'm an auditory learner. So um, I actually read all three of the books, <laughs> and um, the, the Heschel to me was, what is the Sabbath? The Brueggemann was, why does the Sabbath matter? And the Mc I can never say her name, Dana, yes, Dana, is uh, how the heck do I do the Sabbath in this day and age? Um, and so I really got a lot out of all of these books. Uh, Brueggemann in particular uh, says that the Sabbath, that commandment, commandment number four, is what ties, it's a bridge from the first commandment about God, a God who rests, to the last commandments, which are, um, so given that we follow this God, how do we treat our neighbors? How do we live in community? And that this is the bridge commandment for which all things hang, um, and it ties us together uh, as the people of God. And uh, that really spoke to me. It talks about how uh, in the last few months when we've seen this 
spike in violence in our world. Um, Brueggemann really addresses this when he says, uh, people who do not rest, people who do not take that time to say that uh, being is as important as doing, and I am a child of God, and the world can actually turn without me. Um, you know, it is, it is God who keeps the planet in their courses and, and has created us all in his image, and I can take one day to make that time holy and to be and to, uh, it's a great equalizer. If we're all resting, we're not being judged on our production, our commodity, our worth. Um, and so if you can be those people who rest, then you are those people who are reaching out to community and treating them in the way that we, um, that we are being the face of God to one another. Uh, and he says that when we don't rest, when we're run by the clock and by production and by the market, that's the, the natural consequence of that is violence. And I think that's something that we're seeing more and more. Uh, when you're in a rush, you don't take into consideration the people around you. Um, and that goes on all different sorts of levels. So um, that's, that's kind of a, those were my takeaways from the Brueggemann book. Uh, the text on which I was working was uh, Sabbath in the Suburbs, which is a much more practical approach. That She didn't spend a great deal of time reflecting on uh, what is the nature of the Sabbath, what is the meaning of it, and such as that. She took time to say, how can I stop the treadmill on which people are living their lives these days? Uh, she is a married woman. The author is a married woman with, I believe, three children, if I remember correctly. And so is doing all of the I've got to get the kid to soccer. I've got to get the kid to school. I've got to pick the kid up afterwards. I've got the Saturday birthday party. I've got the Wednesday night, whatever. And that she's dealing with those questions uh, actively and, and is trying to answer the Sabbath question from within her context. Um, it was a bit of an irony. It started as a bit of an irony that of the three of us, I'm the one who is not in that life situation. And so I was reading this book and saying, well, it's fine. Just, you know, just stop. Just tell the children to stop. And that's all there is to it. Um, but what I appreciated most about the text was that it was giving me this sense of um, she was speaking from her life experience and saying that it is the, the obligations of parenthood, the obligations of family life that were causing this problem. But I could then say into my own context, I don't have the kids at home, but I do have the other things that fill that time. And I was surprised at how universal many of her points were and how useful they were to me, even though the life situation was different. So, for example, she was talking about when she, as a minister, has that Saturday obligation. If you were trying to observe Sabbath on Saturday, how does she honor her obligations and then jump back into Sabbath or enter that space or not? And I was realizing I have the same thing. And I think all of y'all do as well. Whether it's a church obligation or a family obligation, it doesn't work to say this day is going to be completely clear every week without exception. And so, really, the vast majority of her book is her working through, how can I balance that? If it doesn't work to say, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, every single week I'm marking Sabbath, how can you figure out space in between it? And she works to this idea of behaving Sabbathly, And can you work or do things in a way that makes them Sabbath? So it's not saying a complete absence from labor, which the Orthodox Jewish community would say you can't cook, you can't do anything, but saying, how do we live life at a marked, different pace? And that I felt very, I found very, very useful, even though the context was quite different. It was entirely applicable. So uh, I read the Abraham Heschel book, and, and it's a fantastic starting point, I found, because it's very clearly from a cultural and traditional uh, backdrop that uh, of where obs observance of Sabbath is the normative uh, occurrence, and so he he talks about it in ways that are uh, very natural to him, in ways that uh, that that it is clearly something he has breathed in and breathed out, and it's been a rhythm of his existence for his whole probably his whole life, and so um, I think some of the takeaways that stood out to me. Uh, most especially that as a Christian, I, I, reading this book, I, I had to, to really try to find how do I connect with this book. And one of, the, just even in the very beginning, uh, the, uh, the prologue is written 
by his daughter. And she talks about her experience as a child growing up on the Sabbath. And so much of that uh, part of the book is taken up by describing the actual preparations of actually having to do significant work in order to then meet or greet or welcome the Sabbath experience that time. And so Fridays uh, would be, you know, early in the day would be a shopping and preparing the meals. And even earlier in the week, it talks about this intentional act of preparation, about how it, it takes... Um, great effort to to truly embrace and encounter and observe a, a full Sabbath. And, and looking at that from the Christian perspective, I realize how that is uh, something that is out of the cultural norm for me. It's, you know, we, we kind of look at when is our, um, our, our Sabbath. We can call it kind of a personal Sabbath, but there's something that's very communal about this sense of, uh, that Heschel writes from and that even his daughter describes in which a whole group of people uh, assume this posture and assume this nature of preparation and, and the life around it uh, is able to, to be recognized. And so that was a big takeaway for me was just this idea of preparation. What is the actual work I have to do? It's not just, okay, let me finish all of my tasks so that I can cut it off, but it's actually preparing the holy event, preparing the evening, uh, getting the food ready, inviting guests, having people join you for your Sabbath. It's not just a personal time to kind of recharge your battery, but it's a time in which you gather with a group of people. Uh, as, as you were saying about it's the, the commandment on which they all hinge that keep us so intimately communed, one to God and then also to one another. Uh, another aspect of, a big aspect of Heschel's book also is is looking at time as the, uh, uh, the, the place in which we encounter the divine, a place in which we encounter God, as opposed to a place or a thing. How often it is uh, we can kind of mark our life's events by where we were or what we received or some, some, something that happened. But what he says is, he talks about, look at it as the time, that, that is, um, it is in time where God makes God's self present. And the Sabbath is a, is a glimpse and a foretaste of the eternity. And, and as a Christian and as a, a Christian in a Eucharistic tradition, I was in, instantly taken to the Eucharist and how we see that as a foretaste of our eternal uh, communing with one another and with God. And so this, this idea of Sabbath um, as a foretaste and a glimpse into eternity and how if we cannot, if we fail to, to experience and fully uh, prepare for the Sabbath on earth, how are we then prepared for it when we go into that uh, moment of eternity, into the next life? And so that the Sabbath gives us that, that bridge. And, and one last standout to me was this sense of um, the Sabbath as a guest, as, as a welcoming of, of both, um, uh, this sense of welcoming. And we've been talking a little bit about Advent, about this idea of welcoming and preparing this space. And I think Sabbath is, is that is that welcoming of a guest. And that's part of why I brought in the icon of uh, Mary and Martha and Jesus as, as Mary has received uh, Christ into the home in a way that I am reminded from Heschel about the receiving of or welcoming of the Sabbath, that, that special time in which um, it's a weekly occurrence. But I think the big takeaway for me was this, the, community, the communal uh, nature of it as opposed to just an individual experience of my own place in the Sabbath. That was an interesting area for me to think about as well, the idea of Sabbath being a shared experience, not just a personal one. And I think a lot of that comes from the Jewish tradition, perhaps more so than the Christian one. Um, some of that is based in Scripture, as Brueggemann points out, in the Exodus and the movement of Israel from Egypt. Um, I wonder if you all... And then he, he takes that idea of... Sabbath as being community and not just individual to uh, the ideas of, of, of compassion and justice. You touched on it a little bit earlier, Hester, when you mentioned violence. I wondered if you all could talk a little bit more about that communal nature of Sabbath, how it connects to Jewish history and practice, um, and then perhaps how are we starting to think in those directions as Christians, perhaps more. Yeah, so in the Brigaman, uh, most of it is really revolving around the story of the Exodus and about how we see Sabbath as not, these are all the things you cannot do. Um, I think in, this, in 
our culture, we think of the blue laws, that you can't buy beer, you can't do this, that Chick-fil-A is going to be closed, that kind of thing. What are all the things we can't do on Sunday? Um, but it's saying that it's, it's really there as a gift from God to be liberating. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage in Egypt. And it's not just the place of Egypt, but the model of Pharaoh saying that you are what you produce. You are your worth in bricks. How many bricks did you make today? How many hours did you bill today? How many clients did you see today? Um, How many cars did you manufacture today? You are more than that. I liberated you from that, and that is not what is going to rule your life. So for one day, you are going to be liberated from that feeling of, I am what I produce. And everyone is on the same level playing ground. You are all children of God who are just going to be and to rest. And that when we mark ourselves by our production, there's just there's a restlessness that enters our lives. And it's never quite filled. But when we allow ourselves to rest and to follow the God of restfulness, that that's when we become um, who, who we are with God and with each other. Uh, I think as I was reflecting on how I received the Heschel book on this, um, a lot of it goes back to this to, to the acts of creation and how God looked and saw that it was good and then rested. And, and that this idea of Sabbath rest, you know, yes, it takes us back to the Exodus and it, it takes us even to the depth of the core of, of who we truly are as the creation of God and how often uh, with kind of this conflict for Heschel, it's a conflict between time and space, or time and things. Um, And and these these things, or this idea of space, are the things that we try to control, or we try to produce, or we try to uh, use to give us meaning for who we are. Uh, But really, it is in that sense of Sabbath time where, where we are to be reminded truly that we are, as we have been made, we are God's uh, beloved. And that, that we, in the very core of our created being, are um, this, it's an, we are sufficient, we are good, and we are to be reminded. And, and I was kind of reflecting on this in the sense that um, of all the divine attributes that we kind of try to constantly achieve and grow and, and build our towers of Babel to, to increase our, our knowledge of the world and increase our grasp of, of what we can control in this life, the one commandment that we are given that is probably the most uh, in tune to what God, what we have that is a God-like quality is the quality of resting. Something that God has, has given and done and demonstrated and modeled for us, and that is perhaps sometimes our hardest thing to do, and we have to get out of this cycle of this competitiveness or this way of um, trying to find our value in something other than who we have been at the very core of creation uh, as good. From God. One of the things that Hester said has been sticking with me, as well as something that Rabbi Greenstein said when he was in this room um, two weeks ago. Uh, Hester had mentioned the word restlessness that we have about life, and I was brought back to St. Augustine of Hippo, who sits on top of my stack of books, <laughs> not in that particular volume, but he says, um, My heart was restless until it found its rest in thee, O Lord in the Confessions, which is one of his early works. And it's this wonderful idea that there is no rest for the soul except in God. And we have to look for that. And I remember what Rabbi Greenstein said when he was speaking here that uh, he gave us an alternate translation for Genesis 1 where it says, and on the seventh day God rested. Uh, He said, and on the seventh day God went on strike. That he, he saw that it was very good and he went on strike and he resisted and he protested. And that idea of going on strike, I think, can connect so much to um, McGibbon's Dana's work uh, because she's approaching it in a very different way of not saying how do we welcome this guest, but how do we possibly carve out the room in which this can take place. And one of the images that she's kept coming back to is the idea of the laundry baskets and that they're, they're just sitting there and you have to be able to say it can sit there and it will be all right. 
her cover art is uh, beautiful. That it's got this uh, post-it notes all over there and, and red markings all over her calendar. And if you look at the post-it note at the top uh, left-hand corner, it says, need to buy more red pens. Uh, <laughs> and there, there's something that you need to say, I can do that tomorrow. Um, I know we, we refer to our days off as Sabbath days, and we try to use that language to protect it and to say it's not just Hester's at home today and I can give her a call about whatever. It's no, this is her day to not be here, my day not to be here. And I know that my Sabbath day, I get up, I get dressed, the sheets come off the bed, they go through the laundry, the black shirts get uh, washed, and then I have my system that I work through, and it usually takes me until 10 or 11 o'clock and then sort of ready to begin the weekend. And what she's saying is, what do you want to do? If you were a free person, as Hester had said, liberated, what do you want to do? And there's a point in the book where she starts to realize that some of those things she had just pushed away because, well, that's work and I can't do them, she could do in a way with, uh, with intentionality. If it's not going to be hugely burdensome to toss some clothes in the laundry, then do that. But she was finding herself working and putting so much pressure onto the system of doing it right that she was creating yet more anxiety. Whereas the idea was, how can we be freed from that? And so she goes back and forth through the text of figuring out things that work, figuring out things that don't work. They try different days of the week. They try half days. They try husband and the kids start and she joins them after church. Or They have all these systems, but she's really going towards what's going to work for us. And I think that honors the commandment in a, in a really unique way because it's not approaching the law as this rule book that says you must do the following and you must not do the following. It's saying, what is going to work for you to achieve this goal? And when she gave herself permission to rest into that, I think that's when she started finding more success. Um, and it was a year-long commitment that she had made. And at the end, they said they were going to keep going, which I think was the, that's the success moment uh, of the text. If you don't mind, <laughs> one of my favorite illustrations. <laughs> one of my favorite illustrations in Dana's book is that uh, they went to this pumpkin patch, and the great part of it is it was a pumpkin patch that we went to all three years that we were in Alexandria, and this thing is mammoth. I mean, I'm talking like lines of cars for a mile to get into this place. And it's like Disney World with pumpkins. That's what it is. And so, I mean, she is, I, I could relate to this. She had her map. She had her system. If we hit the hayride early, there won't be a line. And then we can get to the pumpkin patch last so we're not carrying them around. And if we go in this order, it'll all just work out perfectly. And our children get to the part where they're just pouring the cornmeal into the buckets for the, for the animals at the petting area. And they love just the act of doing that. And they end up missing all these other things. And she said, that's what doing it Sabbathly means, is we can still participate in these activities, and we can still work, and we can still do all this stuff, but allow ourselves that freedom to get caught up in something and lose ourselves in it and, um, and not have to live, that the time is not going to rule us, that we're the ones in charge of the time. A metaphor just uh, occurred to me on that topic. When I was living in New York, I always loved going to the Metropolitan Museum. And you go, and there's all these collections. But when you buy a ticket to go to a museum, you feel this obligation to see the whole thing and to push through it and to get every painting and every genre and every everything. The Met, it's impossible, but you feel this, this, this desire to try. When you buy a membership, you just go and you see one wing or one exhibit or maybe even just one painting because you know, oh, well, I'll come back in a couple of weeks' time and I'll try it again. And that was the difference that I was hearing was are you the, are you the museum customer who is on a mission and you are going to learn about French Impressionism come hell or high water, you're going to learn about it, or are you the member of the museum that goes in to appreciate the art? It's interesting because Heschel talks about a, Judaism as being a religion of time and Sabbath as being a palace of time. Um, at the same time, Dana talks about the scarcity of time. Uh, the, our hope is not in there being enough time, but in there being enough grace 
to muddle through the scarcities of our days, which I think is a wonderful juxtaposition. But one thing that they all talk about in their different ways, um, Brueggemann talks about being rather than doing, and then Heschel also says to have more does not mean to be more. And I wondered, and this I think is a question for you all as well, when do we find ourselves being rather than doing? Because perhaps that is the underlying challenge of it all. Um, but that idea of being instead of doing. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I'll uh, reflect on, actually it, for me, it, a lot of it comes to worship um, here at church. And, and I find that there is the right amount of structure to which I am free uh, free to to be um, present in the in the sacred moments of, of the Eucharist, and I think early on, you know, in seminary, I probably overthought and I tried to think, where do I stand? What do I do? What do I hold? What am I saying? But but after the the living the rhythm of it, um, you know, and I think we all have different places where we find ourselves living that rhythm. But you know, in, in the the newness of my priesthood a few years ago, it was it was just living the uh, the rhythm of that over periods of time and, and coming back to that week in and week out to the point where it became the most uh, freeing and liberating and almost, it, it really is the, I think the gem in my week is, is gathering with the community for worship and celebrating the Eucharist. And whichever role I'm in, I, I feel as though I'm in that uh, structure, in that rhythm of life to where I, I'm I'm free emotionally and spiritually um, because there is some some guidance with the Eucharist and with the liturgy itself. But that, for me, is my uh, truly when when it's the most right for me in the Sabbath. I would say with Dana's book, I um I haven't gotten to where I can let the laundry sit yet. That's still my struggle. Um, I can find that Sabbath time once it's turning <laughs> and it's going, but I, I have trouble I letting it. Exactly, exactly. So I still, I do struggle with it. Every single Sabbath day, I sit there and I, um, I say, okay, this one's going to be different. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really allow myself to just be. So for me, it's setting a lunch date with a friend. It's um, saying, okay, today I'm going to go swim some laps. Um, today I'm going to go for a walk along the Mississippi River. Or, um, you know, I'm, I'm at that place where I can schedule that time and help take myself away from the temptations of the laundry or the, you know, the pile of mail or whatever. But um, I'm not quite yet to where I can look at it and resist it. That's why I love Brueggemann's Sabbath as resistance because there is a certain amount of you're having to say, okay, that will wait, and it will be there. Um, this summer, it was that Xander had a tennis clinic that uh, had me out in the middle of nowhere for an hour and a half once a week. And I purposely would just take a book or a notepad or a journal, turn off my phone, leave it in the car, and use that hour and a half because I was kind of stuck there. And that became a beautiful Sabbath time for me. So I still wrestle with Sabbath time around temptations, so I, at this point, am just taking myself away from temptations. <laughs> this gets beyond the, the scope of the book, um, but as, as I personally have, have wrestled with these things, it's about setting up the hedges that are going to keep me from going where I don't want to go. Um, if you're coming to my class uh, on Sundays, we're going to talk about how some of the things, the teachings of Jesus set us up to, if you don't cross this line, then you won't get to this point. And it's this hedging idea, uh, which is very interesting to me. Uh, many of you know that I'm a terrible correspondent when it comes to email. And I get lots and lots and lots of email, and I do not respond to them promptly. And the reason for that is that you can get so absorbed into the email that it becomes the thing that you're doing. What are you doing? I'm doing my email rather than I'm conducting ministry or I'm ministering to this person or I'm moving this project forward. And I don't have the self-discipline, and I know that about myself, to stop. Uh, so, for example, for me, I don't have the ability to check my email except from my laptop. It's not linked to my phone, 
and I don't have the password to do the web interface. So if my laptop and I are not together, I'm not getting church email. Uh, the same with our, our phone numbers. We don't generally publish our cell phone numbers, but we have an emergency phone that we share. And so if there's an emergency, you can call that number and you're instantly into the system. But we have that little bit of space. And I think that's so helpful, uh, not just for clergy, but for all of us to say, how available is okay and how available is not okay? Um, when I was in Roanoke, I used to take horseback riding lessons. And it's a bad idea to text and drive. <laughs> it's a worse idea to text and ride. <laughs> you have no choice when you are riding a 1,500-pound animal but to pay attention only to that animal and where you are. And so my phones, and even when I was emergency priest on call, both of my phones stayed in the car for the two hours that I was interacting with that animal. Um, on Saturday morning, uh, all, all of us were in some way involved either with an activity or with the St. Jude Marathon 5K Half Marathon. There was, we put the phones down. And there was some gift in saying, the phone can stay in the car for the next two hours and we'll catch up with everything when we get back. Um, so for me, it's, it's, excuse me, it's setting up those boundaries that will force me not to be distracted because I know that I'll be distracted without them. Um, I share that with people who are in the business world, and sometimes your um, expectations of your employer are not as flexible as the expectations of my employer, and so you can't quite do that. But the principles are good, is that how do you set that? And how do you say, this is the point beyond which I will not go? Because there has to be a stopping. And I think all three books speak to that, speak to that idea. Let's turn that question out. I'd love to hear some of your all's thoughts on how, how do you find moments or days of Sabbath? When are you just being rather than doing? Certainly for me, walking on the green line, I take my cell phone, but it's so it can do my, my, my fitness thing. I don't have music on or anything. And I find that my mind wanders uh, and rambles. It does both. And in the course of the rhythm of my stride and the wandering of my mind, I periodically make connections with God that I would not otherwise make. And, and, and it can be the fall leaves. It, it's not necessarily that I'm praying or anything. It's just there's awareness that God has given us this space and that I'm doing my body good by using it. Isn't that right, Jack? Early in the morning. You're using Early in the morning, that's right. <laughs> That was Charlton Lyons. Anybody else would like to? Sarah. Oh, and Eileen. Yes, yes. Uh, two things come to mind. I've been able. Oh, I'm Sarah Cowan. Cowan, A N. Um, <laughs> right, E N S. Um, I've had the pleasure and the ability to be able to go to two. Um, St. Clair silent half-day retreats at St. Columba for November and December, and I, it, the, the effect that I have felt has been wonderful, so, you know, that's been a, a part that I, I think maybe could continue and would it be a regular Sabbath activity. And the other thing that comes to mind is that um, I've, I've, over the last couple of years, with some spiritual direction, had the ability to sort of liberate myself from thinking that prayer has to happen when you're very quiet and centered and there's no distractions and things like that. And instead of thinking, instead of just thinking that your thoughts sort of kind of slightly directed at God will become prayer. And so that's been another thought that I'll share. I'm um, Eileen Olowinski, and I'm putting in a plug, but centering prayer is 
to me, um, a Sabbath that can be done anytime, anywhere. Um, and it's um, a practice that I started um, back in '04. And, um, and anyway, that is truly a Sabbath. I mean, that is a 20-minute time out. I'm not, I'm not even listening for God's voice. I am simply resting with him. And it, I don't know, it can be very, it can be very renewing. Anyway, just, just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'm Linda Thompson, and um, I have permission to be here from the choir master, by the way. <laughs> it's a very big deal. It is a very big deal. <laughs> um, Two weeks it, before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I was going to say was I, I'm actually seconding what Eileen mentioned because what I discovered in Centering Prayer, much to my surprise, was that I actually enter into it, no matter where I am, at home or in the chapel, I really don't know what happens to time. I, I, and that's, for me, amazing, because I'm very always aware of time going by, either too slowly or too quickly. But I'm absolutely lost in that silence. And when the little bell goes off to say that 20 minutes is up, I'm always surprised. And I'm not sleeping. <laughs> At first I thought I was, and that's why it was so restful. But I'm not. But I'm not, because I actually have fun. Anyway, I also wanted to tell you all, there's a free Centering Prayer app for the iPhone. That does that for you, sets the time and rings the bell and everything. So you can do that with your own phone on your own phone. So technology and Sabbath are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So, John. No, I read the, my group read the Brueggemann book, and uh, it got me thinking about the Sabbath more and more and how I need to be more purposeful about my Sabbath. And so I've been making a real attempt to do that. Uh, with varying degrees of success because there are many distractions around. But uh, I found that uh, when I do that, it kind of leaks into the other six days. And I'm more at peace uh, on the other six. And when things go awry, I'm not so quick to react uh, emotionally or violently or aggressively. And I can just sort of take it more in stride. <clears throat> and I've been having to do that a lot lately because, uh, you know, um, the, every time I pick up a newspaper, I'm just assaulted with things that rob me of my ser- sense of peace and serenity. And I've been trying to take myself back into Brueggemann's book and to try to rest more, realizing that, these things are going to come at us, the Paris, the San Bernardino, the raving politicians, and that, <clears throat> that these things will pass in God's time. And it has helped me keep my sense of peace. So I think I've noticed it more in, uh, when I can feel my blood rising a little bit and I have to stop and say, wait a minute, let's, let's pull it back down just a tad. And it's been really helpful. Oh, Jack Richbork. Anyone else? We're preserving this for posterity. Yes, we are. <laughs> I don't know how many of you all were here last Lent when we did an adult forum on mindfulness, and Catherine House came and spoke to us about the mindfulness that they're doing with the girls at St. Mary's. But one of the things that they do is they have a mason jar with liquid in it and glitter. And when they have those moments of feeling like the world is going to end because I just got a C on my algebra test, the entire world's going to implode, you shake up this jar and you give yourself the space to let all that glitter settle. And you can just feel all that anxiety going away because you realize the world is not ending. There is time to breathe. I am okay you're okay, we're okay, we can move on in a more calm and collected manner. And I think it does, it takes the focus away from us and puts it on God. And, um, and that's a reminder that I think we often need because we come from a society that says you are in charge. And uh, to remember that we are actually not in charge of everything and don't have to be.
is, um, is what Sabbath is about for me. Having 800 girls uh, around us all the time gives me reminders of uh, parts of my life that I would not have otherwise be reminded of. And when Hester mentioned the I just got my C on the algebra test, it, um, it, the parallel that occurred to me is that I look at that and say, that's really not a big deal. It's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal. But in the moment, I remember that being absolutely crushing and devastating. And I'm wondering if that gives us a sense of that Kairos time, that God's time, that in our lives we see the, oh my God, this is terrible, this is the worst thing ever. And God looks and says, well, isn't that cute? (laughs) Isn't that cute? Um, And when Linda was speaking about time sort of disappearing, um, I was one of the things that I often do in my office when people come to see me for counsel is that something has driven them there. And there's something that has caused them to want to speak to the priest. And sometimes we need to regain control of the conversation from that circumstance which has taken control. And one of the really powerful techniques to do that is to say we're going to observe 30 seconds of silence. We're going to stop. And we're not going to speak, and we're not going to describe the incident. We're not going to say, this is what counsel is necessary. We're going to stop for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. We still have 59 more minutes in which we can talk about anything else that we need to talk about. But we're going to stop. And the second gift is telling people that I'm going to be responsible for our time. So I will watch the clock. And I have little clocks hidden around my office so that I can do it discreetly without having to do the old watch thing. But to say, I will be responsible to see that you get out on time to what we're time for, which gives the person with whom I'm speaking the freedom to not worry about it. That's been my responsibility, and they can then exist in that time. And there's something that's a gift in that, at least that I see on the faces of the people who come to speak with me. Um, And maybe that is the idea of Sabbath, too, is that God is saying, I'm going to be responsible for all of this for the next 24 hours. And then you can pretend that you're responsible for it. But for the next 24 hours, I got gotcha. you. And maybe that's a gift, too. One of the questions that had come from the small groups was, is Heschel um, still relevant in the 21st century? And I, I, I think perhaps, um, if I'm understanding that question correctly, is that that uh, approach to Sabbath perhaps um, still relevant in the 21st century and Hester I was thinking about the glitter jar and that's a ritual in a way Um, is there still a place in many ways we're creating our own Sabbaths Dana certainly um, talks a great deal to that in her book but is there still place for ritual for um, for those thou shalt not in a a more positive sense uh, in our Sabbaths today I think that would be our greatest hope and our greatest uh, claiming of the Sabbath. Because I I feel like when you can um, when you can mark it, it it means when you can share it. it. I think that's the piece that keeps us remembering that it's not, you know, a me and God experience where I'm trusting for myself in God, but it's in this sense where we share uh, this gift of life, and we share this gift of of, of, um, of our community and of being together and of freedom. This sense that that we don't have to uh, claim all of the control. But I think what what that uh, ritual does is it ties us one to another, and I think it that's I think that would be our our uh, greatest striving and endeavor. And I think maybe that's part of why for me it's in the Eucharist. It's it's in that tradition that. It, it keeps me in the lane with my fellow Christians, my fellow uh, um, family members in Christ, that, that this ritual, that this tradition um, keeps me t- tied to, to God and to one another. And I think that is most imperative for our Sabbaths. Dana, I think, had spoken with um, a, a Jewish friend who's, who had two different dishwashers. Um, and she said, well, you know, it just seemed to her too much. And she said, actually, her friend said, I, I take great joy in, 
in going even to that extent because it reminds me of the Sabbath and of the faith behind it and in the everyday things like washing dishes, um, even though that seemed extreme perhaps to some of us. So, In the remaining time, I'd like to open it up to any questions that we haven't touched on that you all may have or any other stories or uh, thoughts that you have to bring up. Um, are there questions from the, from the group? No, I was just wondering, what are the limits of all this Sabbath business? I mean, are there times when we need to just let our passions go unbridled? And uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> not for you, Jack. Uh, no, Sorry. I mean, maybe for some of us, but not for so me. What I'm trying, I'm not talking about. But if you're passionate about justice uh, or uh, something of that sort, are there times when you need to overturn the money? changers tables in the temple uh, is, is there a time when you need to uh, uh, make the first last and the last first I mean isn't there sort of an edge in the gospel where we need to do that sometime and how does that w interplay with with the Sabbath thank you Jack I'll give a reflection and then pass it around uh, I think that's exactly right, and I think that's exactly where, where Jesus brings to the, to the conversation as a, a first century Jew is the sense that it is a gift for us in the Sabbath. It is not meant to enslave us yet again. It is not something that is to, to bind us to a system, uh, to a system where, and even at that day and time, I, I think it's a, it was a system where people could still be left out um, in that. So I think there is a very clear call in our Christian faith to, to see the Sabbath as a gift and, and to remember that the Sabbath was given to man, not man to the Sabbath. And I think that's precisely uh, the balance we have to strike. But again, I think it, it looks at the Sabbath as um, as gift, not just individually, but how can then I gift and share? And I think for Heschel as a Jewish uh, person, he for him, the, the Sabbath was always having company in his home, always having someone there and having guests. And and it opens us up to people around us, I think, in ways that we otherwise might keep ourselves closed off. So hopefully the gift of the Sabbath, uh, seeing it as a gift and also seeing it as an opportunity to envelop the community more deeply and intimately uh, would be a goal. But I think you bring up Jesus' point exactly. Some of the very few times when our communications minister gets frustrated with the rector is when he becomes incensed by something and takes out a piece of paper and writes a letter to someone expressing how incensed he is on that subject. And there are some interesting letters in the file having to do with any particular incident that got me that morning. Uh, so what I'd like to say to answer Jack's question is absolutely there are times when we just need to call a spade a spade. And we don't need to, we don't need to be politic about it and we don't need to... Uh, 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 be um, reserved about it or say, you know, and you might disagree with me, but we just need to say that's where it is. Um, I had a, a bit of a feeling around that in last week's sermon when it was time to just say directly that the offense against our faith is not greeting cards and uh, coffee cups, but violence pervading our country. That is the offense against the Christian faith, and it needs to be named. Um, where I would connect it to Sabbath, though, is that stopping to pause to make sure that the indignation you're feeling is indeed righteous indignation and that acting on that indignation is going to further God's hope for justice in the world, not just make me feel better. And I think that it's the pause, that Sabbath discipline of pause, that informs us of when it is those times and when I'm just upset. Because when I'm just upset, that does not necessarily mean that the poison pen needs to come out. But when injustice needs to be named, when um, decisions contrary to our faith need to be called out, the, the Sabbath pause gives me the ability to discern those moments more effectively. And to your credit. <laughs> it's <you>. very <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't pull out the poison pen. Any editing I do is almost always tone and language, never content. <laughs> not using certain words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just here and there. Just every hour. I think another connection to the Sabbath is that 
that distinction of when is it about me and when is it about God? Um, you know, when is that focus about the way that I'm feeling and when is it about doing God's work in the world? And, um, and that's often a hard one to distinguish. And sometimes it takes uh, several turning over of that glitter jar to get there. Um, how much of this is about me and how much of this is about God? And, uh, you know, when do I need to be the voice and when do I just need to get out of the way and let God do God's work? So, um, you know, that's another piece of that Sabbath that, again, we, we're always wrestling with it. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't, and we just keep going back to it. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Robert Probst, and uh, I was just going to mention to uh, Jack's point uh, in the Heschel book, uh, on Sabbath, uh, even though he was involved very deeply in demonstrating this uh, Vietnam War and so on and so forth, on Sabbath, he would never talk of anything in any negative way. It was always joy, happiness, and so on. So uh, the point being, I found that difficult. How do you just step back from these passions and things going on in the world? But apparently he found a way to do that. That was the time. Sabbath was, we don't do that. It was all joy, so. Thank you. Anyone else? We have probably about 30 seconds left, I believe. Are there any other questions or comments, though? Do you? Don't set a slave to time. We'll just consider this our Sabbath. Okay. <laughs> Well, I was in Heschel's, this is Charlton Lyons, I was in Heschel's uh, class with, with Robert, and, and I, want some, I want to summarize the feeling that I've got about the Sabbath and pick up on some of the things that everybody has said here. And that was the Sabbath was created uh, or given to us as a time for us to appreciate that we were created by God and therefore acceptable in his sight as we are. And by having the community of Sabbath and that understanding of self, we can then encourage others who are with us to experience that same rapport and understanding. And in the course of doing that, we both become holy. That's what I got out of Heschel's and there were many parts that I did not understand. But the sense of community and belonging to God's kingdom and being okay just the way you are creates a peace that is that you only get in centering prayer. No, no, I, I think that's true. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from our panelists? All right. Um, maybe I'll close just briefly with words from Heschel. Um, six days a week we wrestle with the world, bringing profit from the earth. On the Sabbath we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Thank you very much. Good night. We did all select a different array of books.